I'm Andrea Beaton, and I'm here with a few of my co-authors today to talk about the recent scientific statement, Prevention of Viridin's Group Streptococcal Infective Endocarditis, which is the highly anticipated follow-up on the 2007 American Heart Association guidelines on the use of antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent endocarditis in cardiac patients undergoing invasive procedures. Michael, can you start off by telling us quickly why the 2007 guidelines were so important? Sure, Andrea. Those guidelines uh, published in 2007 were really a, a landmark uh, publication that reflected a change in thinking for the American Heart Association and for the public in general regarding the approach to prevention of endocarditis. For 50 years before that time, uh, the extensive use of antibiotics was considered part of mainstream prevention of infective endocarditis. That changed in 2006 for almost all types of patients who undergo dental procedures and for the types of procedures that they underwent. In addition, strict limitations on the use of antibiotics for non-dental procedures were also addressed in that original document. And finally, uh, a change in thinking of the way we look at the risk uh, factors associated with infective endocarditis was developed in that document with a shift from the emphasis on the risk of acquiring anti, uh, infective endocarditis to a new view that the risk of complications from having infective endocarditis should be more of a factor with regard to who receives antibiotic prophylaxis. That was a pretty dramatic shift in practice that you described in 2007. Do we know how those guidelines were received or anything about adherence to the 2007 recommendations? We actually do. Uh, there have been several good studies that are summarized in the new manuscript uh, concerning the response of the dental community and the uh, medical communities uh, to the uh, 2007 statement. Uh, in fact, there was a good uh, understanding of the uh, new document and uh, a good level of awareness that was achieved amongst uh, our dental colleagues in particular. But compliance was somewhat variable. Uh, and there were a lot of factors related to that, some historic, uh, personal preference by uh, individual patients, and also uh, some need to uh, readjust thinking on the part of the uh, discussion that involve, that's involved between a healthcare professional and the patient. So compliance was variable, uh, awareness was generally very good. So it's now been about 14 years since that fairly dramatic shift in recommendations. What have we learned and what is the American Heart Association now recommending, Greg? There have been several studies that have looked at the frequency of endocarditis and complications, including morbidity and mortality from um, Veridin's group strep endocarditis in patients across the risk spectrum. And there are no convincing evidence-based studies that suggest that there has been an increase in the incidence of endocarditis or the morbidity or mortality from endocarditis in patients at low, moderate, and even high risk groups. Uh, the 2007 gu guidelines specified the four highest risk groups that should continue to re receive prophylaxis, including patients with prosthetic material, those with a history of endocarditis, those with congenital heart disease, and those undergoing heart transplantation with valvulopathy. And there are no, there's no evidence to suggest that any of those patient groups had an increased morbidity or mortality from endocarditis um, as a result of the change in practice in 2007. I had a specific question. In, in relation to these guidelines, and given that there's been some important advances in interventional catheterization procedures since they were first published, I was wondering if you could comment if there are any implications around effective endocarditis prophylaxis given the dramatic increase in the number of percutaneous valve placements. In particular, any specific data focused on pulmonary valve implementation for congenital heart disease? I think that's a really important question because the practice of medicine has changed quite a bit in the last 14 years. 
and we know that a large number of adult patients are receiving transcutaneous valves in mostly in the aortic position and to date there is no evidence that those patients would specifically benefit from antibiotic prophylaxis before dental procedures however the current statement does specify that that group is in a higher risk category and is still included on the list of patients that should receive antibiotic prophylaxis. There are some really interesting data in the congenital heart disease population around pulmonary valve placement. And the specific type of valve, which is valves that are based on jugular vein valves, specifically the Melody valve that we use in the cath lab and the Contegra valve used in surgery are at higher risk than valves made of other material. So it has nothing to do with the way the valve is placed, whether it's catheter-based or surgery, but the material that is used for the valve. And those patients had a significantly higher risk of endocarditis. And certainly in patients who have received those valves, there should be a strong consideration for using antibiotic prophylaxis given they have significant morbidity and mortality from endocarditis. Most notably, almost all of them would require a subsequent surgery if they got endocarditis. I wondered if someone would also comment on the emphasis of shared decision-making that's so present in this document, as well as the other non-antibiotic recommendations that were made. Uh, this really is uh, getting to the uh, heart of the matter, so to speak. Um, the current recommendations reviewed uh, the 2006 guidelines, as we said, but really brought to bear a much greater discussion on the need for shared decision making between the uh, healthcare professional, the dentist, and uh, the patient. Uh, and this is particularly true uh, in uh, populations where uh, non congenital heart disease or interventional heart disease uh, associated with catheter and surgical interventions is present. And I'm speaking specifically of the rheumatic heart disease population, which around the world uh, still remains a uh, serious healthcare issue, even if not in uh, 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 some of the uh, more developed countries. Uh, and in those populations, we know that endocarditis is a high cause of morbidity and mortality. And even though uh, group, uh, Viridan's group streptococcal endocarditis is not necessarily, has never been demonstrated to be a uh, really fundamental issue compared to say staphylococcal endocarditis, each individual patient uh, should have a discussion with the individual uh, healthcare professional uh, and come to a shared decision regarding the use of antibiotics before dental procedures in that group of patients in specific and in general. Uh, the other important message that uh, uh, the writing group was interested in reaffirming was the critical importance of oral health and the maintenance of as excellent oral health as possible uh, as opposed to just uh, reliance upon antibiotics to prevent uh, uh, Viridans group streptococcal related infective endocarditis. That remains really essential. So Craig, I wonder just in a few sentences, can you please reiterate the takeaway message for clinicians that is in this new updated statement? Yes, I think that the statement first and foremost confirms that the 2007 guidelines were appropriate in the approach to focus on preventing morbidity and mortality from endocarditis and the, the key points that Michael just emphasized in terms of shared decision making and good oral health are the most critical in ultimately reducing the morbidity and mortality from endocarditis. Thanks Craig and Michael for being with us today and for all that great context. It's been a pleasure working with you guys on this statement. And remember, for everyone listening, the full statement is now live today on the Circulation website.